Sorry about the short lunch, uh, short break there. Well, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, which is Professor Chris French. Chris is head of the Anomalistic Psychology Research Unit in the Psychology Department at Goldsmiths University of London. He's a fellow of the British Psychological Society and the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, as well as being a distinguished supporter of the British Humanist Association and a member of the Scientific and Professional Advisory Board of the British False Memory Society. Chris will be giving an introduction to anomalistic psychology. Thanks, Ian. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah great. Um, I've not actually had time yet to take part in the Paranormal Olympics. I'm hoping I'll get the chance in a wee while. Uh, but I always like to start these talks by getting at least a rough idea of how psychic my audience is. So I'm going to try a little test with you. I'm going to see if I can transmit a thought from my mind into your minds. Okay? I'm going to keep it very simple. I'm going to try and transmit a number between 1 and 10. Not three, that's too obvious. Okay, so number between one and ten. Just make a mental note of the first number that comes into your head now. Okay, now obviously some of you will get it right just by chance, so we have to take that into account. So we only get ecstatically excited if it's more than about 10% of you that get it right. Okay, so could you put your hand up if you thought of the number seven? Okay, I think we've got more than 10% there. It's hard to say. It's not an impressive result. I was expecting better from you, I must admit. Uh, let's try one more. This time, a bit more complicated. I'm going to think of a two-digit number. It's less than 50. Both odd digits, and they're not the same. Okay, so it could be 15, 1 and 5, both odd digits, not the same. It couldn't be 11, both odd digits, but they are the same. So the first number that fits that description, less than 50, both odd digits, not the same. First number that comes into your head now. Okay, did anybody think of 37? That's better, that's better, you're improving. Did anybody think of 35? Anybody? Sorry, my fault, I thought of 35 and then I changed my mind. I, was, I confused you there, I apologise for that, sorry. Okay, now does, is that any kind of evidence for telepathy? Well, no, it's not, surprise, surprise. Technically speaking, it's what we call population stereotypes. There are various situations where it feels as if you're making a free choice amongst a number of different options, and your intuition would tell you, therefore, that the frequencies across those options ought to be more or less the same. The thing is, it just doesn't work like that. We know that the responses will cluster in predictable ways. Nobody's quite sure why, but we know it happens. And so you can exploit that to make it look like you have psychic abilities, when maybe you haven't. I mean, back in the 70s, famous Israeli psychic who was quite fond of suing people um, would appear on national television and say, I'm, I'm visualizing a, a simple line drawing now, I'm sending it to the viewers at home. And what did that line drawing tend to be in the office? Anybody? A little house, yeah, somebody said it. About 10% of your audience would go for a little house. And if you've got millions of viewers, then that's Lots of people sending in their pictures of little houses, and they're all, they can all be shown in the studio the next day, and uh, it looks like, to some people, as if Uri Geller, oops, what a giveaway, really did have psychic ability. Um, now, you can actually exploit these kinds of effects in magic tricks as well, so we'll try one more little demonstration of this guy. This time, you can be really tricksy. Don't just go for the first card that draws your attention. You can change your mind. But I do want you then to settle on one of them and just concentrate on it, okay? Concentrate on the card that you've chosen. And now the magic happens. I've taken one card away, and I predict that your card has disappeared. Can you put your hands up if your card has disappeared? They should all, you should all have your hands up now. <laughs> now that demonstration isn't in fact based on population stereotypes. The first ones were, genuinely. Um, that one's not, that's based on a different principle. I'm sure some of you already know how that one's done. And if you don't, I'll leave you to figure it out for yourselves. There is a little message even there, that sometimes you get certain mentalists and conjurers who produce amazing effects, and then they'll sometimes go on to explain how they've done it. And sometimes those explanations that they give you 
are what we psychologists refer to technically as a load of old bollocks. Um, the name Darren Brown just came into my head. I don't know what Weird. Right, okay, let's go on with the sort then. What is a novelistic psychology? Well, this is a rather wordy definition we have on our unit's website. It may be defined as a study of extraordinary phenomena of behaviour and experience, including, but not restricted to, those which are often labelled paranormal. It's directed towards understanding bizarre experiences that many people have, without assuming a priori that there is anything paranormal involved. It entails attempting to explain paranormal and related beliefs, and ostensibly paranormal experiences in terms of known or knowable psychological and physical factors. So you can see it's generally a sceptical approach in the sense that our working hypothesis, our initial assumption is paranormal forces don't exist. Now we're not kind of dogmatically saying we know that they don't exist. What we're saying is if we assume they don't exist, can we explain these experiences, these reports in, other, in terms of other psychological factors? And then we try and set up tests of those explanations, of those hypotheses, and see if we can produce evidence to support them. So what I'm going to do today is just a kind of very, very whirlwind tour of just a few examples of the kinds of things that we do. What I'm meant to say is very important from the outset is that, as I said, we don't start from the assumption that we know that paranormal phenomena just don't exist, they're not real. And so sometimes we have to put quite a lot of our time into testing directly paranormal claims. Now, I could give you lots of examples, I'm just going to give you one. This is something from last year, the uh, Halloween Challenge 2012. This little happy bunch of people. Um, you've got, uh, you know him. Uh, that's Simon Singh, the science writer, and that's Mike Marshall of Merseyside Skeptics. And these two lovely ladies are professional psychics, Patricia Cutt and Kim Whitman. And they were willing to be tested under properly controlled conditions. So how do we go about testing? The claims from psychics. Well, one way to do it, it's the way that we did in this study, is to get a number of volunteers, oh sorry, should actually give credit to the whole team, although it's a very simple experiment to describe, to actually do it properly <coughs> and make sure that you're doing it in as well controlled manner as you can, involves quite a number of people as you can see. So all of those people are helping out on the day, plus a few others that aren't in the picture. But um, what we did, we got a number of volunteers, here's three of them, to come along and have readings done for them. Now the claim that's being made here is that the psychics can tell people stuff about themselves, that they're gaining the information psychically, that they don't need, they're not basing it on what people are saying to them or what people look like, that they're doing, they're just using paranormal powers to do it. If that is the case, then if we get a number of volunteers to come along, have readings done for them, but the volunteers themselves are not aware of which reading has been done for them, if they all then come back and rate the readings, there ought to be one there that stands out. It ought to have a lot of personal details that are relevant to that particular individual's life. And so that's essentially what we were looking at. There's a bit more to it than that. You'd obviously do a very different reading if you're a psychic for an 80-year-old man compared to a 15-year-old girl, okay? So, first thing is we had all of our volunteers, we had five volunteers, all female, all between the ages of 18 and 30. But we went one stage further than that, and again, our psychics were quite happy for us to do this, we had our volunteers behind a screen. And also, the, the psychics were not allowed to actually talk to the volunteers, and similarly the volunteers could not say anything, they just sat there while the reading was being done. And the readings were written down. Okay, we then get those volunteers to come back, they go through, they've got two sets of five, five each psychic did up readings for each of the five volunteers, they go through each of the two sets, and we see how many they got right in terms of the individual concern choosing the reading that was actually done for them. Um, so that's a very simple, straightforward experiment, let's say. We said to pass the test, there was quite a strict criteria, so we had to get them all right, five out of five, but we acknowledge that four of them, we give away. <laughs> Um, we realised that four out of five would have been statistically significant. We'd have acknowledged that and would have said, we'd like to test you again, it was really interesting. Um, how did they do? Kim Whitney got one, and she got none. Um, so no evidence of psychic ability there. Um, so then, with lots of other tests as well, we've tested, um, what's his name, Derek Ogilvy, the so-called baby psychic, 
Chris Robinson, the dream detective. Uh, we've tested Ben's research relating to precognition. We've tried to replicate it and failed. Uh, we've tested downsters. We've done lots of these things. We don't get significant positive results. Um, okay, why do we bother then? Why are we looking at this? A lot of mainstream scientists will say, why are you wasting your time with all this stuff? We know it's all nonsense. Well, firstly, I don't think we do know it's all nonsense. There might be some of these things that are true. And we should always be open-minded to that. Now, personally, if I had to bet, I would bet against the existence of paranormal phenomena. But I might be wrong. And it might be that somebody in the next month or the next year will come up with a reliable way of demonstrating that telepathy or precognition is real. And I have to be open to that possibility. So that's one reason for it. You know, I think it's going to... I think it's unlikely, but if it happens, it would be such a revolutionary finding, it would change our scientific understanding, so it's important. But secondly, if you look around the world, at any society, at any point in history, anywhere, in, anywhere geographically, you'll find a sizable proportion of the population believe in these things. We saw data yesterday that over half the population of the UK believes in ghosts. And a sizable minority claim to have had direct personal experience. So there's something of interest there for psychology. Either paranormal forces really do exist. If they do, then science ought to get over its prejudices and just study those phenomena in the same way that we study any other aspect of the natural world. Or alternatively, if paranormal forces don't exist, we can learn a lot about human psychology by studying these experiences and trying to figure out what is at the base of them. So either way, we win. It's worth taking them seriously. Now, in terms of, as I said, the main strand of our research is attempting to explain ostensibly paranormal experiences in non-paranormal terms. Now, I'll give you a few examples of the kinds of things that we do. One of the threads that runs through anomalistic psychology is that of cognitive biases. Although our cognitive systems are absolutely amazing, every second of your waking life, your mind is, working, is, is processing information in ways that, as yet, we can't get computers to do. It'll come, but as yet, we're still, we still do things that they can't. But we also know that they are prone to certain systematic biases that can affect perception, can affect memory, can affect judgment. Okay? And some of these might be relevant. So that's one line of research. Um, that's just what I just said, really. One of these uh, examples would be the fact that we are all really lousy, intuitive statisticians. There are lots of situations in everyday life where you have to estimate probabilities, and we're just not very good at it. Now, why is that relevant? Well, it's relevant because very often when somebody claims that they've had a paranormal experience, nasty, boring old skeptics like me will say, maybe it was just a coincidence. And people, people who've had the experience typically reject that. They don't think that what they've just described could be explained away as just a coincidence. There's a couple of reasons at least for that. One is the emotional impact that being involved in that kind of event has. Whether you're a believer or a skeptic, if some unlikely co-occurrence of events takes place, you tell people about it, you're excited, you see, you'll believe what happened to me. Okay, so that emotional impact, and then they say, boring old skeptic says, Phew, just a coincidence doesn't really seem to do the job. But you might even, if you go a stage further, you might be able to sometimes at least be able to guesstimate the probabilities involved. And there might be literally millions and millions to one. So how can this smart-ass skeptic tell you it was just a coincidence? Well, when you think about it a bit further, you'll realise that a lot of the time, unfortunately, it probably was just a coincidence. I mean, the kind of examples I've got in mind here are things like you're thinking of someone that you've not heard from for a long time, the telephone goes, you pick it up, and it's them. And, okay, is that some kind of spooky psychic connection? Well, it might be, but it might be just a coincidence. Think about all of the people, think about all the names that you think about in a day, all the people you think about, and the phone either doesn't go at all, or the phone goes, it's someone else. You don't even notice those things, it's not a non-event. But the phone goes, and it's the person you were thinking of, you notice it. The phone goes and it's someone you're thinking of and you've not heard from for a long time, you notice it even more. It may be that there was some kind of other factors involved, not just probability. It may be that the day before on TV, there was an item on the news about some ageing rock star who'd been taken into hospital. 
And that got you thinking back to the good old days when you used to go and watch that band with your best mates at college. And you've lost touch with that person now. And you really should have them up. And you're there reminiscing about the good old days. And the next day, you're still reminiscing, still thinking back to the good times you used to have. The phone goes, and it's that person. Now by this point, you've forgotten what started you off thinking about them. And what you don't know is they also saw the news last night, and they've also been reminiscing, and they've also been thinking, I really ought to get in touch, and they've just done it before you have. But you've both forgotten the cause. Well, another example would be precognitive dreams, okay? You have a dream, and then something happens in the next day or two that bears an amazing correspondence to the contents of your dream. Now, was your dream some kind of mysterious glimpse into the future, or was it just a coincidental match? Again, you initially think, well, you know, maybe it was millions and millions to one that I'd have that particular dream and then that would happen the next day. Millions and millions to one. Can't be a coincidence. But there are over seven billion people on the planet and we all dream every night. Even if you just assume on average remember one dream per night, that's seven billion opportunities every single night for a coincidental match to occur. What would be really spooky is if it never happened. That would need some explaining. That wouldn't fit what, how, what we think about probability. The fact that it does happen is exactly what you expect. Chances of winning the jackpot in the national lottery, one in 14 million. Most weeks, somebody wins. Okay? Enough, it's a lot of large numbers. Enough opportunities for very rare events to take place, they will take place. It's as simple as that. And other factors can come in as well. But the good ways that psychologists have studied how poor we are expecting probabilities with problems like this, the famous birthday problem, some of you have seen this before. The idea is, how many people would you need to have at a party, just selected at random, to have a 50-50% chance that two of them share the same birthday? Little word of warning here, if you're organising a party, don't just invite people at random. It'll be a shit party. I hope you'll know each other, they won't talk, you're rubbish. But assuming that you were foolish enough to do it, what are the probabilities? Well, if you've got two people, you've got one chance in 365 that they will have the same birthday. If you've got 366 people, you are absolutely certain you must have one pair with the same birthday, because if by some strange fluke, the first 365 all had different birthdays, you've used up all the dates of the year. There's no dates left. Next person must match somebody. So somewhere between two and 366, there's this magic number where you've got a 50-50 chance that you'll have at least one pair with the same birthday. When you ask people, they will typically say 200, 120, the actual answer is 23. That's all you need, and that strikes most people being far too low. So whenever you're at a party and you get some people saying, hey, just, we've got the same birthday, isn't it amazing, spooky? No, it's not. Uh, if you've got 35 people at a party, you've got an 85% chance that you've got at least one pair with a, with a that share a birthday. So take bets on this. You can make money here. <laughs> you won't always win, but you'll be right more times than you'll be wrong. Okay. Um, and it turns out the people who believe in the paranormal, the evidence is mixed on this. It's not, it's not entirely consistent. But where the difference is found between believers and non-believers, believers are a little bit worse than the non-believers. But we're all bad. We're all bad. Um, another reason you might believe in the paranormal is because you've actually been to see a psychic and you've been blown away by what they've told you. And the typical line is, tell me things they couldn't possibly have known any other way. Well, again, maybe, maybe they really are psychic. But there are other possibilities. There is a technique, as I'm sure you're aware, known as cold reading, that can be used to convince complete strangers that you know all about them. And there are lots of different aspects to cold reading, but if you're going to set yourself up as a fake psychic, it's a very, very useful skill to have. Um, I'm mean, actually do a course on anomalistic psychology as a third year option on our BSc degree and I teach the students about cold reading so that when they graduate and they can't get jobs <laughs> now they all get jobs obviously all this. Anyway, uh, one part of cold reading is something called the Barnum effect and that refers to the tendency that people have to accept vague, general and ambiguous statements as being descriptive of their own unique personalities so we're going to do a little bit of role play now. You've got to imagine that I'm doing a reading and it's just for you. It's not for anybody else. And uh, you can tell me whether or not you uh, think this is accurate. What I'm sensing is that you have a great need for other people to like you and admire you. You do have a tendency to be critical of yourself. You have a great deal of unused capacity, which you've not used to your advantage. 
while you do have some personality weaknesses, you are generally able to compensate for them. Disciplined and self-controlled outside, you tend to be worrisome and insecure inside. At times, you have serious doubts as to whether you've made the right decision or done the right thing. You prefer a certain amount of change and variety, and become dissatisfied when hemmed in by restrictions and limitations. I mean, just think about the opposite of that sentence. You don't like change and variety, and you're satisfied when hemmed in by restrictions and limitations. <laughs> um, the, next, the, next, uh, the next sentence is my favourite. You pride yourself on being an independent thinker, and do not accept others' statements without satisfactory proof. You have found it unwise to be too frank in revealing yourself to others. At times, you are extroverted, affable and sociable, while at other times, you are introverted, wary and reserved. <laughs> Some of your aspirations tend to be pretty unrealistic, and security is one of your major goals in life. Now, it's a classic classroom demonstration. You give the students sealed envelopes, you tell them that a local astrologer has drawn up a personality profile of them, and you get them all to open the envelopes, just look at your own statements, don't look at anybody else's, and rate it on a five-point scale for accuracy. And most of them will give it a four or a five. And you might say, well, hang on, Mr. Smarty Pants Skeptic. The reason they do that is because it is actually accurate. It's describing what it means to be human for most of us. And that's a very good point. The thing is, if you also ask them to what degree is a description very general and it applies to everybody, or it's uniquely applies to them, they tend to think it's uniquely applicable to them, and that's where they're making the mistake. So there's lots of those kinds of statements that you can make. <laughs> Uh, but there are others that go beyond just personality. I mean, what I came across fairly recently was uh, you're in the middle of a reading and you say to someone, I'm, I'm getting something about an unfinished book. Now, that's a really clever one, because if they happen to be writing the book, wow, how on earth did you know that they were writing a book? But if they're not writing a book, they will just think of a book that they got halfway through reading and couldn't finish off, or something they're reading at the moment. But you've got a guaranteed hit. It's either a minor hit or a really good hit, but it's a great life. Anyway, um, right, I'm not saying, I should make it very clear at this point, by the way, I'm honestly, genuinely not saying that all people who claim to have psychic powers or to be astrologers or tarot card readers are deliberate con artists, but I genuinely do not believe that to be the case. There are some people who are, in my opinion, deliberate con artists. <coughs> Sorry, just clearing my throat there. Um, but. The vast majority of people who claim disability, I think, are often fooling themselves, as much as they're fooling anybody else. They are cashing in on the same technique as cold reading, but not doing it in a deliberate way to try and deceive people. And they're gen generally very nice people. Um, right, moving swiftly on. One thing we've got very interested in of late is memory, because usually you're not dealing directly with the paranormal experience or event itself. You're dealing with someone's report of it. So, how accurate are those reports? I'm sure you're all familiar with the literally thousands of studies that have been done with staged crimes and you look at eyewitness testimony and you find that people get, make a, 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 amazing mistakes. But it might be more surprising that even relatively simple stimuli, things that you have seen literally thousands of times in your life, you can still get wrong. So as an illustration of that, how is the four represented on clocks and watches with Roman numerals on them? Is it like this clock here, I, 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 or like this clock here, I, V? How many people think it's I, 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 I? Quick show of hands. How many people think it's I, V? Quick show of hands. Well, I obviously wouldn't be asking you if you were going to get it right, would I? Because I'm a sneaky psychologist. Um, so, a big surprise is, folks, this is how it's represented typically on clocks and watches. But only on clocks and watches. Everywhere else, it's I, V. But on clocks and watches, it's represented in this rather unusual way. Now, what that illustrates is that memory does not work like a video camera. You couldn't think back to the last time you saw a clock or a watch with Roman numerals on them and replay the video. What you do is, you think, well, how are fours represented in Roman numerals? They're represented as IV. Yeah, well, they usually are, but not on clocks and watches. So it's what we call a top-down, it's the influence of top-down processing, where your beliefs, your knowledge, your expectations about the world can actually influence both memory and perception. I'll give a few more examples of that later on. Another interesting phenomenon is what's called memory conformity. If you have just a single uncorroborated eyewitness account, 
You probably won't give it as much evidential value as if you have numerous eyewitnesses and they're all giving more or less the same story. And that's probably quite a reasonable thing to do. But one thing to bear in mind is that if people have seen something unusual, like a possible UFO sighting, or a ghost, or a mess monster, they will discuss it with each other. And one person's account can actually influence another person's memory. And this has been shown under well-controlled conditions in lots of studies in a forensic context, where of course it's hugely important because the majority of uh, miscarriages of justice are based on unreliable, un faulty eyewitness testimony. But we thought it'd be interesting to look at in an anomalistic context. So we replicated an experiment that was first reported by Richard Wiseman and Emma Greening. I'll describe that experiment as it's interesting in its own right. They had a video, a bit of video footage of an alleged psychic, he was in fact a conjurer, doing a spot of the old psychokinetic metal bending. I don't know if you saw in the news today, by the way, there's a little story that uh, apparently Uri Geller scratched his neck and his head fell off. That's the, that's the clean version of that joke. Um, <laughs> what, uh, what, what Richard and Emma did, they showed this, this video and half the participants, after the key had been bent using sleight of hand and placed down on a table, half of them heard the psychic say, hey, if you look closely you'll see it's still bending. The other participants got exactly the same video, but they didn't get that verbal suggestion. Those who got the suggestion, 40% of them reported they thought the key carried on bending. It didn't. But for, it's a huge effect for a very simple manipulation. It's the kind of thing that conjurers know how to, how to play with. Um, they did it in two studies. We borrowed the same uh, recording we used in our study. We threw in a memory conformity element. We had subjects watching in pairs, but one of the pair was in fact Stooge who was working with us. And that person was instructed, after they watched the video, they were told to discuss it, and he was told to say either yes it did carry on bending, or no it didn't. And we found, well for our start we found that the believers were more susceptible, even the paranormal were more susceptible to the suggestion of the non-believers. But we also found that the stooge subjects also had an influence. So you got the suggestion from the psychic and the reinforcement from the stooge, then we got to levels of 60% of people saying they thought the key carried on bending. As I say, it didn't. Okay. Oh God, it's depressing when I look at this now. It's 10 years ago I published a paper um, which, which examined the relevance of research into eyewitness testimony for reports of anomalous experiences and also the more recent research into false memories. And the difference there is that a false memory isn't necessarily a distorted memory for something you actually did witness, it's a completely fabricated memory for something that never happened at all. And um, the reason that this, there's a lot of research in this is rather a tragic one. Back in the 80s, particularly in America, uh, but also over here, and it's still going on today, people were going into therapy for very common psychological problems, you know, low self-esteem, anxiety, depression, no memories have ever been the victims of childhood sexual abuse. And by the time the therapy had finished, they were convinced that they were the victims of childhood sexual abuse, typically at the hands of their own parents. And this was tearing families apart, people were going to prison. It's very serious stuff. But the big question was, were these recovered memories true memories of things that did take place, or were they false memories? What, as I say, they want silver lining to come from this very... By the way, just <laughs> the word of... Yeah, you're very close to the centre for the British False Memory Society that's based in Bradford upon Avon, so I just thought I'd mention that for you. Um, fine organisation. Um, at least I think that's what they're called. No. <laughs> um, what it did is it generated lots of research, so we now know that people are a lot more susceptible to false memories than, than we might have guessed. The sizable minority of the population, we can put them through various kind of experimental procedures and we can implant memories for things that didn't happen. I won't go over time to the details. But what we've been able to do is look at the variables that correlate with susceptibility to false memories. Things like dissociativity. This is the tendency to go into kind of mildly altered states of consciousness. And the best way of saying this is what my grandma would, people that my grandma would have described as being away with the fairies. So you know the kind of people I mean. People that are also, people that are be fantasy prone, they're often very creative individuals, very artistic people. Absorption, they're people who get very totally absorbed in what they're doing. If they're reading a book, if they're watching a film, if they're doing a crossword puzzle, they shut off the outside world totally. Uh, hypnotic susceptibility. All these things tend to intercorrelate. They also correlate with susceptibility to false memories. And interestingly, they also correlate with paranormal belief, 
and the tendency to report paranormal experiences, which raises at least the possibility that some reports of paranormal experiences may be based upon false memories. We did a little experiment to try to get some more direct, in, in method, direct approach on that. We gave 100 participants a news coverage questionnaire. Basically, if I were to say to you now, who were you with, where were you, what were you doing, when you first saw the footage of the Twin Towers collapsing, I think you'd all be very confident that you'd answer those questions and you'd be pretty sure it was a real memory. So we call a flashbulb memory. Now it turns out that even flashbulb memories are not as accurate as we once thought they were. But that's, that's another story. It looked like we were doing an experiment on flashbulb memories, but actually we were being a bit sneaky. We included in there an item that had not actually been caught on camera. I say they're the first Barney bombing because there was a second Barney bombing and that was caught on camera. But that didn't take place until after we'd done our experiment. What we found in line with similar research was that 36% of our participants said they could remember this non-existent footage. They could tell us whether it was in colour or black and white. They could tell us if there was a commentary, what language it was in. They could tell us what the quality of the picture was like. It doesn't exist. It's a false memory. And those who said they could remember it scored higher on measures of paranormal belief and experience. So it's some kind of support. We've replicated the effect and other people have as well. So it looks like it's a fairly robust effect. Now I said, I said a bit more about top-down processing. I'm just keeping an eye on the time. Um, top-down processing is absolutely essential. We wouldn't be able to manage without it. And when you're interacting with the world around you, you've got two sources of information. You've got the bottom-up information coming in directly through the senses, but sometimes that can be degraded or it can be ambiguous. And in order to make sense of it, to disambiguate it, you use top-down influences, your knowledge, your belief, your expectations about the world. And that's, as I say, it's absolutely essential, but it can lead to misperception. It can lead us sometimes to see things that aren't actually really there. Uh, I'm just going to give you a few kind of fairly light-hearted illustrations of that. There's a phenomenon known as pareidolia, a type of illusion or misperception involving a vague or obscure stimulus being perceived as something clear and distinct. And one of the things that we tend to see in the visual realm, in random stimuli, is faces. Faces are a hugely important stimulus for us, and parts of the brains, parts of our brains that are hardwired to process information about faces. And so sometimes we'll see faces when they aren't really there. This is a classic example. This is um, a cinnamon bun that some people think bears a striking resemblance to Mother Teresa. Um, so that's Nun or Bun, the Immaculate Confection. If you can't make it out, there's a little animation here to help you. And uh, this is a more recent example. This was a grilled cheese sandwich which. Uh, someone took a bite into and then thought they saw the Virgin Mary looking back at them. Um, this went for $28,000 on eBay, so it really is worth keeping your eyes open. Uh, now, I'm going to finish with how I said in all my talks. <laughs> uh, well, it wouldn't be right, I'd be right to talk about it. Um, the most, it obviously works in the auditory domain as well. I think that's particularly relevant when we're talking about things like EVP. Very often you find with EVP clips, that you can't actually make out what they're supposed to be saying until someone tells you, or you read it, and then you think, oh, yeah, I can't hear it now. But again, that's top-down processing. I would say that a lot of the time, not all the time, sometimes there genuinely is a voice there. I don't think it's the voice of a spirit, but there, <laughs> there will be a genuine voice there. Um, but a lot of the time, there probably isn't even a, a proper message there, or the message that you're hearing is not the one that is the one that's really there. It's the influence of top-down processing. The most striking example of that that I've come across relates to the claim that there are satanic messages in rock music. There's an idea that's put about by a lot of Christian fundamentalists in America, but you can't hear these messages unless you play the record backwards. Okay, now according to them, it still has an effect, it still influences the youth of America, presumably leading them into sex, drugs, and even more rock and roll. Um, but, let's say, the websites you can go to, and you will again typically find that you can't actually hear the message until you've read what it's supposed to be. The top of the satanic pops is Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven. I'm going to play you a clip, first of all, forwards, for no other reason than I like it. <laughs> I'm then going to play the same clip backwards, and I, your, the challenge to you is, I'm not going to tell you what the satanic message is at this point, you tell me what you hear. My prediction is that, unless you've heard it before, 
A couple of you will make out one or two words, but that'll be it. Mostly it will sound like backwards gobbledygook, for the very good reason that that's exactly what it is. <laughs> I'm then going to tell you what the message is, I'm going to play the same sound file again, and the second time it will sound completely different. You will hear the message as clear as a bell, and you will wonder how you missed it the first time. Now the reason you missed it the first time is because it isn't there, right? Now, all right, I'll be play, play it forwards first of all. Now, under the ethical guidelines of the British Psychological Society, and I'm sure that the same kind of considerations will be given by ASAP's ethical guidelines, if you do not want to run the risk of becoming the latest recruit to Beelzebub's army, <laughs> you can leave the room now. It's too late for me. I go around singing the backwards version to myself, so... Uh, <laughs> now, here we go. This is the backwards version. See if you can pick up on the satanic message. I mean, your expectation was satanic messages, yeah, what's the word you're going to hear? Satan. And you did. Um, this is the full message, according to the people who believe there are messages there. Here's to my sweet Satan, the one whose little calf would make me sad, whose power is Satan. He'll give you 666, supposedly the devil's number. There was a little tool shed, I can explain the tool shed, where he made us suffer, sad Satan. And now I'm going to play it again, I promise it's the same sound file, but now you've got the words up there in front of you, it will sound completely different. Websites that have got this. It's a particularly good one. It's run by a guy called Eric Milner, where you can play the sound. Well, there's lots of other examples. That's the best. A lot of the others sound nothing like that. You know, it's supposed to be saying something, and it not not really. But that one is great. And there are a few others that are very, very good. Um, but if you play it to your friends, do it the way I did. First of all, play it without telling them what they're supposed to hear, because that's the striking thing: the difference between when you didn't know what it was supposed to say and when you did. Now. Um, I hope you can give him to give you a kind of whirlwind tour here, but if you want to read more, <laughs> there's a wonderful book coming out on the 1st of November, and uh, there are flyers out there for 15% off if you're interested, so uh, do have a look. Um, right, well, I think just for the final comment, lots of people, I've said this yesterday, but I will reiterate it, that like, sometimes people see a normalistic psychology as being opposed to parapsychology. I have to see it as complementing parapsychology. If parapsychologists ever do get to the point, and I don't think they're there yet, but if they do get to the point where they have a reliable, replicable demonstration of a paranormal effect, that would be a fantastic breakthrough, and I'd like to think that a normalistic psychologist will have helped them to get there by helping them to sort the wheat from the chaff, to sort the genuine psychic stuff from what looks like it's psychic but isn't. Now it might be that there's only chaff, but if it's as the case, it's really, really interesting chaff anyway, so, you know, let's, let's take it seriously. 
Uh, at the end of the day, it may well be that the truth isn't out there, the truth's up here. Thanks for listening. quite a lot of study that's gone into it. How do you sort the wheat from the chaff when somebody reports something? How do you know whether it is a false memory or something based on heightened emotion or stress? I mean, I mean the short answer is you, you can't. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't presume to. If somebody's had an experience, it wasn't recorded in any way other than in that person's memory. I wasn't there at the time. I mean, you can't do it. So in, in that sense, you know, you, you cannot actually as definitively say, oh no, I don't think that was paranormal. What you can do is to do the kind of thing that we have been doing, which is looking at, well, how, exactly how malleable are, is memory? Exactly how prone to hallucinations are people? You know, we do a lot of work, work on sleep paralysis. Um, uh, how suggestible are people? You can look at those kinds of things, and it's not building up a kind of, you know, like a direct case, to say, oh, it's one of those negatives. You know, you can't prove that the paranormal doesn't exist. You logically just cannot do that. It may be that it's just around the next corner. But if you can provide plausible counter explanations that are self supported by good empirical evidence, then I think that at least tilts the, tilts the scale in one direction. But yeah, you're quite right. You can't, for any particular individual's claim, unless it was all done under very well controlled conditions and everything was recorded. You just can't, you can't do it. Chris, as a human being, um, have you ever had any experiences where you think, I just, I just don't know how that happened? Yeah, I've had a couple. Um, I mean, again, I've got, I mean, I've, I've had things that have happened to me that I think if I had a different belief set, I would have interpreted as, as paranormal. I've had kind of fairly mild sleep paralysis episodes, for example. And in terms of kind of taking part in like various TV programs and investigations and running experiments and all that kind of stuff, the vast majority of the time, it's just not left me feeling that there was anything that couldn't be explained in conventional terms. But there are a couple of exceptions. These are not cases where I think, oh, well, that, that's it, it convinces me there is something. I've kind of got a mental box with a question mark on the top. I'll, I'll go with the details, but a couple of them, there's a guy, so in a documentary a few years ago now, The Man Who Paints the Future. This was an artist who claimed that he had dreams and then the things he saw in his dreams tended to come true. And one of the examples was the Twin Towers, for example. He had two dreams about the Twin Towers. One was about a month before it happened. The other one was five years before it happened. Uh, what he used to do, he used to toddle down to his local bank and have, he used to paint a picture. He'd wake up, he'd get the image fixed in his mind, he'd come down to an artist, he'd paint a picture, maybe draw a few notes on it, then toddle down to his local bank and have a picture, a photograph taken of himself standing in front of the date on the wall to show that he hadn't painted the picture afterwards. And it was five years to the day <laughs> but he held this picture of the Twin Towers collapsing, not quite in the way they actually did, but come on, you <laughs> know. Um, and the date on the wall is 9-11, <laughs> so, well, 9 September. So, I mean, that would be one example. There are a couple of others, but there are cases that maybe think, mm, I wonder, yeah, maybe, maybe. And again, you've got to be open to the possibility. What would convince me totally would be a reliable, replicable demonstration under controlled conditions, you know, that, that more than anyone would have a good chance of being able to replicate. And I don't think we've got that. Um, I think we've got time for just one more question. Hi, Chris. Uh, it's a very good lecture, thank you. Um, my question is kind of in two parts, and uh, it's going back to the beginning of the lecture when we were talking about uh, the psychics. First of all, how did you actually recruit them? Um, because obviously it's a case of them putting their reputation on the line. And secondly, what was their reaction uh, when they were confronted with the poor results? Well, uh, in terms of how we recruited them, as you say, it's, it's not necessarily easy. A lot of psychics would not take part in a test like that, and I think the very fact they would shows that they were genuine and sincere. 
And in actual fact, Patricia put, we had already tested once before, and she got zero in that test as well. Um, but she came back for more, you know. Um, it's a, the, the, the reaction is always the same. I mean, that interesting, the first time that we tested Patricia, very, very confident that she would pass the test. And, and again, it's extremely important that the people that you're testing agree that it's a fair test and that they can perform under those conditions. No point in doing the test otherwise, we have to sign something that says that. Um, but then you can pretty much guarantee that once they've failed the test, they will then decide it wasn't a fair test after all, and they'll make up various reasons, some might say excuses, as to why it wasn't a fair test. And what was interesting about Patricia, on the first t test that we did on her, that she failed, her reaction was refreshingly different. She said, oh, I'm cosmacked. Yeah, I really should have been able to do that. Oh, that's, that's, that's very weird. And then a couple of days later, she decided it wasn't a fair test after all, and you know, it started slacking us off. Um, but but that, that happens every single time, you know. I, I mean, when we tested uh, Derek Ogilvy, the, um, the baby psychic, he claims he can read babies' minds even before they learn to talk, he can read their minds. And it's not just, oops, I've just pooed myself, or uh, I'm hungry. Uh, it's all stuff about kind of, you know, the family's business affairs, and whether the cars were running properly, and all this kind of stuff. Anyway, he failed the test and he was in literally in tears after he was very, very upset. He was crying to him. I said, Well, really, it's over. And I'm saying, You know, I'm a very skeptic. Don't worry, your fans won't take any notice of us. Your career's fine. <laughs> and indeed it was. No. Okay, well, um, I'm sure you'd all like to show your appreciation again for 